Bueno, vamos, vamos a ir arrancando en cualquier cosa de aire y paisandú cuando les parezca que de repente los no sé, si quieren intentar algo o si ven, de repente avisan para ver si están viendo o, o lo que fuera. Estaríamos eh, arrancando. Hoy la idea, bueno, es el lunes, que fue la primera parte de este mini curso de, de investigación y estadística. Gracias. Y ahora sería la, la segunda parte la, de, de ese curso. Y mañana, para avisar por ahí si, si, si están, si nos acompañan, mañana sería a las 4, una hora y media más o menos de, de charla sobre entrenamiento. Sobre no recuerdo bien el nombre de la charla, pero la ventana por ahí era más marcadores biológicos de sobre entrenamiento o algo por ahí. Entonces, bueno, eh, eh, retomamos. Gracias, Juan. Sí. Gracias your patience in dealing with our technical difficulties. <laughs> so again, I'll remind you that you are welcome to have copies of these slides. All you have to do is contact me. Tonight, we'll talk about the second part of research design and statistics. And the emphasis tonight will be on using certain statistical tests to analyze data, and then talking about writing research papers for publishing. And you will notice, especially if you saw the presentation the other night, there is typically far more information on my slides than I just say and present to you, which is why I suggest you may want to look at them. And again, the slides are, appear a little bit small and out of focus. I apologize for that. If we summarize what we talked about with design, we know that there are some non-experimental observational designs. There are some experimental designs that are also able to be used. We view observational as a lower level or a weaker type of science. We consider experimental designs where we're manipulating independent variables to be a much higher level, stronger science. And again, I will remind you, lower level of science doesn't mean bad science. This type of research is very important. It's just this type of research allows us to pursue finding much closer the truth about something we are investigating. And as we talked about the other night, discovering the truth about things and the relationships they have, that's part of the scientific method. So where are we if we have been talking about research? We have covered this part 
where planning a study, thinking about a research question, and what might be some of the different approaches. Once you do a, a study, then you have to analyze the data to be able to try to see what has occurred. And that's where we are tonight, to talk about the analysis. And then we'll move to talking about interpretation, writing things so that people can find out what you did. Now, as you look at that flow diagram, you would think, oh, I decide what statistics I'm going to use after the study is done. Good scientists decide their statistical test before they do the study. We call that a priori determination. You're allowed to change your mind and you're allowed to use different statistics after you do your study, but that's viewed as a post hoc determination. A priori determination tells people you really understand what you're doing, how you've designed your study, and what's the best way to seek the truth. But I will point out, again, some of the funny aspects of the use of English. In statistics, post hoc has two different meanings, even though it's the same words. In a little bit, I'll explain the second meaning of post hoc. So, statistical approaches. First of all, most people in doing science now will run their statistical analysis using computer software that they might have on their laptop or their desktop computer. I am old enough to remember that when I started research, the computers we used would have filled up this room. My laptop is more powerful than that computer that filled up an entire room when I started in 1979. And there are a variety of software programs that you can use from your laptop, your desktop, to run your statistics. They are all good to a certain point, but all of them have some bad features too. Yeah. Tonight, the examples of I will use a program called Statistica. Software que es 
not because I think it is the absolute best and the most powerful program. But because it's free and you find many people throughout the world use it because it is a free software program. So, in looking at statistical tests, we divide them into two basic categories. And we saw one of those categories the other night, descriptive statistics. I look at everyone in this room and I say, oh, I want to know what their average age is. So we add up everyone's age, do the math, 27 years old. with a standard deviation of five years and a range of 22 to 37. But that just describes you. And again, in observational studies, that's fine. But as we move to more higher level science, moving towards experimental, we use a different type of statistics, what are called inferential. Inferential statistics are divided into what we call parametric and non-parametric statistics. And parametric and non-parametric are each divided into statistical tests that are for determining association or differences. Each of these can do association and difference statistical tests, but each of those has different tests for determining difference or association. And when I say statistical test of association and difference, let me simply explain what I mean. Association statistical test look at two different measurements, two different variables, and see if they are related. Men getting older, men becoming more bald. I'm losing my hair as I get older. <laughs> An association says, oh, younger men would have more hair, older men would have less hair. Statistical test of difference compare, in this case, 
men and women, but it could be more than just two groups, to see if they differ on the same measurement, same variable. I measure the height of all the women in this room. I measure the height of the men. I can take the average of the women and the average of the men. See if there is a difference to tell me which is taller, which is shorter. So parametric and non-parametric can do each of these types of comparisons, association, or difference, but they use a multitude of different tests to do it. What you see listed here are some parametric tests test of difference, test of association. Here you see some non-parametric test of difference. And test of association. This is not an exhaustive, complete list for association and difference, parametric and non parametric. We would be here much too long tonight and into tomorrow to talk about all possible tests. These tend to be the tests that we see used in a lot of research that is in physical education and in health and the exercise sciences. Those are the ones I want to focus on tonight. So let's go to our first example. I said the other night that we could look at children who are physically active and compare them to the children of the same age who are physically inactive. I measure body fat, that's my dependent variable. And I measure it in both of my groups. And now I want to know if there is a difference in the body fat because of the activity of this group versus the active inactivity of that group. I could statistically analyze this parametrically with a t-test or an ANOVA. Or I could analyze it non-parametrically with what's called a Mann-Whitney U test. What I can do and what is right can be two different things, though. Okay. And again, I apologize. I 
designed so that the projected bigger would be sharper to see some of this. What you actually have here is two different groups of children. And you have 25 of them that are very physically active and 25 of them that are not very physically active. And here is their percent body fat. Here is the results of a T-test analysis, an ANOVA analysis, and a Man Whitney U analysis. These analyses tell me that the two groups differ in percent body fat. The children that are physically active have a percent body fat of 19 and the children who are physically in inactive have a percent body fat of 21%. So at this point, I can say, oh, niños of eight years old being physically active can cause them to have lower percent body fat. Okay. But the question becomes, how do I know it's significant? And then which of these is the more correct analysis? Okay. One of the things about the Statistica program is when you run the analysis, if you get statistical significance, it prints everything in red so you immediately know that you've had success. <laughs> But what you're really looking for to determine significance is the P level or probability level that is displayed within the summary of the statistical analysis. And notice the format of each one of those summaries for the different analysis is structured slightly differently, but they all report a P probability level. In our scientific area of a probability level smaller or equal to 0 0.05 is statistically significant. <laughs> What that is saying is if we did this experiment a hundred times, twenty-five active niños, twenty-five inactive niños, and I go around Uruguay and do measurement at a hundred different cities, a hundred different schools, each 25 and 25, it says so, 
it says that 95 times out of 100 doing that same experiment over and over, I'll get the exact same results. For us, 95 times out of 100 is a high enough probability level that we feel confident in saying there is a significant difference. Only five times out of a hundred would we get different results. And so we feel very comfortable in saying the probability, the likelihood, is you're always going to see there being this type of difference. Sí. Sí, que me estaba diciendo ¿Sí? ¿Se está escuchando? Hola. No sé, estamos en Paisajú de Iberal. And if you could read this probability right here, you would actually see that it is 0 0.01, so much less than 0 0.05. So actually, if we run this experiment 100 times, 
our data says that 99 times we're going to get the exact same results. And that's what we're looking for to be able to determine whether there is a our children in their percent body fat. This also relates to the topic we had the other night of type 1 error. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Remember, type 1 error is saying that there is a difference between our comparisons when actually there isn't. A probability of 0.05 says that only five times out of a hundred would you make a type 1 error. A probability of 0 0.01, only one time out of a hundred would you make a type 1. And in the context of science, as we mentioned the other night, we strive and try very hard not to make type 1 errors. If the probability was not what it is, but it was actually P equals 0 0.15. I'm only having the same result in my experiment 85 times out of 100. Which is actually sounds very good, but statistically in science we say no, that is unacceptable. It's too high of a type 1 error rate. A moment ago, I emphasized in our field of study probability at p less than 0 0.5. There are some fields of science that set their probability levels for statistical significance at a much, much lower level. In pharmaceuticals where they develop drugs, many times they'll say, we are only willing to accept a type 1 error 0.1% of the time. We want our results to be 99.9% .9 repeatable and correct. They want to make certain if
Go ahead. <laughs> The acceptable the acceptable P value is something that is not decided by you. It's really decided by your field of study. Mm -hmm. Companies set their probability so high because they want to say we are almost 100% certain if we give you this drug it won't kill you. <laughs> And most of us that have to take certain drugs are pretty happy to know it's not going to kill us. Okay. I mentioned that we had three analysis on the last slide. A T-test, an ANOVA, and a man Whitney U. The first two are parametric, the last one was non-parametric. The data that we were looking at is percent body fat. start, okay. okay. 
question for right now. Still not. Yeah, it's still it's not considered. It's a continuous spectrum, but there's discrete intervals, so it, it's not considered. Yeah. in the basement. Thank you. 
que eh, ahora te, te, te vi en la pantalla ahí Javier, creo que me, me estás escuchando bien, bien vi. Eh, estamos esperando por Facebook pero creo que seguimos con que estamos esperando por Facebook ¿Y quién ven, ven, ven el PowerPoint? So in the example I just gave you, two groups of children, three different statistical analyses. From a statistical perspective, the Mann-Whitney-U non-parametric test was wrong to be used. But remember what I said the other night. Computers are stupid. They will do what you tell them. Non-parametric statistical analyses are designed to deal with data that does not have a normal distribution. Sometimes it's referred to as ordinal or nominal data. And an example of that is what I wrote on the board. If I asked everyone in the room, how happy are you, and you are to give me a number, five, four, three, two, that is the kind of data that is designed for. Percent body fat is the type of data that we call interval or continuous data and it is associated with parametric analysis, either one of the ones I used. When I run non-parametric analysis on the wrong type of data, I increase the likelihood of having a type 1 error. The type 1 error, again, with doing the wrong test, even if it's by accident, is still a type 1 error and it's viewed as very bad science. So let's look at a, another example. Niños that are physically inactive, one group, highly physically active, two groups, a low level of physical activity, three different groups. Because of the type of data, I run a parametric analysis. Parametric. 
what is called an ANOVA or a one-way between groups ANOVA. Earlier, when there were two groups, I could run a t-test or I could run an ANOVA. And if we could see the slide clearly, you would find out that the probabilities with those two analyses are exactly the same. But now I have three different groups to compare. And so I compare this group and this group and then that group. I cannot correctly use a t-test because it is designed to only compare two groups, not three or more. An ANOVA is designed for comparing three or more. Pero, you could say, I want to do a t-test between this group and that group. That's two. And then I'll do another t-test between that group and that group, because that's two. And then those two groups. And your computer would say, no problem, I'll do it. Type one error. Multiple t-test when you should be using an ANOVA increases the likelihood of a type one error. So doing those multiple t-tests, if I found significance, I'm probably saying something is significant when it actually isn't. The ANOVA calculates the mathematics for the determining significance different from the t-test and it accounts for the multiple comparisons. And you can't see the numbers but you'll perhaps tell that they are in red and again that tells you within this program that you have statistical significance. <laughs> and the probability here is highly statistically significant. 0. .000012. <laughs> <laughs> So as a researcher, you would be very excited. And again, you're saying, oh, look, within these three groups, my ANOVA has told me I have big differences. And if we looked at the actual calculated means that I developed, 20, 19, 24 for percent fat. So what's the next logical question you would ask yourself? What's different from what? 
está la diferencia? ¿Tiene los tres grupos o es uno por uno? The ANOVA test tells you that there is significant difference, but it does not tell you what is different from one another. You have to apply another statistical test to tell you which group mean percent fat are different from one another. And this is where that word post hoc comes back to have another meaning. When you have significance and you are comparing three means, three groups, or more, you then apply a special statistical test called post hoc analysis to find out where the difference is. And here is the actual post hoc analysis using a procedure called a Tukey post hoc. And if I, rather than reading the numbers off, if I go back to this, what you find is the physically inactive niños are significant from the highly physically active in percent body fat. So those two groups differ from one another, but these two do not. So whenever I'm comparing three or more groups, three or four or more means, ANOVA first, find statistical significance, post hoc analysis. ANOVA analysis, no statistical significance, stop, you're done. Turkey. Yes. T U K E Y. Looks like Turkey, but it's Tukey. <laughs> okay. And since she asked that question, there are many different post hoc analyses that you can use. See. You, as the researcher, decide which one you want to use, and, and I typically use a Tukey. Now, this is percent body fat. It is comparing three groups, but it is an analysis. But I made the computer run a non-parametric analysis. Just so I could illustrate to you that you can run non-parametric 
uh, comparisons with three groups or more. No problem. You have to have the right data, as we talked about. This is the show you what happens. The right data you can do a Wallace, which is a non-parametric for looking at questionnaire data. And this is the summary table for that non-parametric ANOVA, and it's statistically significant. And here's the post hoc analysis called a multiple comparison post hoc for that. Again, I'm using the wrong data, but I wanted to show you if we had the right kind of data for non-parametric, no problem. We can do the same kind of analysis as if it was the parametric data. And I apologize, I failed to remind you if you didn't already know, ANOVA is an abbreviation for analysis of variance. Yeah. Most people would not even write that, they would just use ANOVA because it's so well recognized in science. So this is the results that we have for the ANOVA one way, the Kruskaus Wallace. And one of the things we sometimes will do as another post hoc is called effect size. So I would do my ANOVA, I would do my post hoc, again a Tukey or a multiple comparison, and then another post hoc analysis called effect size. This post hoc for effect size, the most common that is used is called Cohen's D. There's all kinds of interesting names and in statistics. Effect size is something that is calculated to tell you if your differences are clinically meaningful. If our niños have different percents of body fat, and that's statistically significant, that's wonderful, but does it mean anything that they're going to have better or worse health? Okay. 
and effect sizes are tools that are used statistically to convince your reader that the statistical differences you saw mean something that is good for your subjects that you're examining. If you remember from the other night, one of the designs I talked about was not looking at two different groups, but measuring one group, intervening with exercise activity, and then measuring them again so that it's one group measured at two different times. This is a quasi-experimental design. It's also sometimes called a prospective design. Remember the other night I talked about retrospective. People are doing something themselves, they did it in the past, and you're now looking at them to see if it had an effect. Prospective is you look at someone for a characteristic and then do something moving forward and measure them again. Another phrase as a design term you'll sometimes see a pro, uh, used with these are called repeated measures. Hello everyone. <laughs> I know those names are multiple for the same thing and that's one of the problems with statistics, is we have terminology that is such that it's overlapping. Okay? All right. So if I have one group of children, I measure their body fat, and now for six months, I make them physically active, and I measure their body fat again. I can analyze these two measurements with a t-test or an ANOVA, but now it's called a repeated measures ANOVA. The t-test could be used, but it's a different type of t-test than the earlier one I showed you. 
This is what's called a dependent t-test, sometimes also called a paired t-test. And the mathematics are slightly different to account for the fact you're looking at the same sample subjects at two different points in time. My, that's my mission. <laughs> Here, to pass it down. Yes. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Are we ready? This is an important distinction. If I'm comparing one group to another group is an independent t-test or sometimes called a groups t-test. If I'm measuring one group, but I'm measuring them one time and then another time, that is a dependent t-test or a paired t-test. Again, the computer will do whatever you tell it, but you have to recognize to tell it the right thing and the right analysis there. So here you see the results of the analysis. And again, I've made up some data to force the program to run. And it's significantly different, both with the t-test as well as the ANOVA. And what you find is in the data I made up, their percent body fat went from 20 to 18. So it's 20 here, it decreases to 18 in the same people later. Statistically significant. If I had a data set that was for non-parametric analysis, I asked you how happy you are before we started the lecture, and now, almost two hours into it, and I wanted to compare, I can do that. I could run a Wilcoxon sign test 
for data, or I could run a Friedman ANOVA, and they will give the same kind of analysis, but again, not for data like body composition. That needs to be the parametric analysis. What if I have my children and I measure them, make them physically active, measure them again, and then make them more physically active and measure them a third time? Three comparisons of the same group. I can't do t-test, that's going to be a type 1 error, but I could do my repeated measures ANOVA. <laughs> There's my ANOVA summary table. Here's the actual mean values, 20, 18, 17 percent fat. And then because I have three means, I have to do a post hoc analysis. And again, that example is a Tukey post hoc. And I didn't do the next post hoc, the effect size, so there wasn't too much on this slide. And if I had non-parametric analysis data and I had asked you something like this one time, two times, three times, then I would have to run the Friedman ANOVA. <laughs> what if I'm doing a more complex design? I'm moving much more towards from quasi-experimental to actual experimental. Two groups of children, both physically inactive. One group, I make them physically active for six months, and now they're being assessed again for percent body fat. The other group that was physically inactive, for that six months, I let them stay physically inactive and I compare their percent body fat. This is what we called the other night a factorial design. And it is referred to as a two by two between, within, factorial, experimental design. So the terms here in English, between, within. 
presento Bisui Wiki. The between is referring to the fact that you are now going to compare this group to this group. The within refers to the fact that each of the groups are compared first and then a second time. So the two there would tell you, oh, I'm looking at two groups. The two there tells you that within each group, I'm looking at them twice. So this is explaining the design of the research study to you. So to do this particular analysis, I have to do a factorial ANOVA. And that ANOVA would look at the differences between the groups and then within the groups. There is no non-parametric analysis that you could use if your data were of this type. Non-parametric analysis is not, as statistics, is not designed, excuse me, structured to deal with factorial designs. But what if you are a, a researcher that is collecting non-parametric questionnaire data and you have this type of design? Most statisticians are going to say, don't do it. <laughs> But if you're going to do it, then use a factorial ANOVA to analyze your data, even though it's the wrong kind of data. Because it's your, your only option. Pero. But recognize you're very likely to have a type 2 error saying something's not significantly different when it actually is because the ANOVA is going to increase that risk of type 2. So this is the factorial ANOVA on the correct type of data, percent body fat. Here's the ANOVA summary table. Here's the percentage of fat, the actual mean values, the averages. Here is the Tukey post hoc procedure. 
And then w one of the other reasons I sometimes like to use the Statistica software is it automatically creates a graph showing you your outcome of how things changed. And I'm a very visual person, so even if it didn't give it to me, I would draw it out so I could look at it. Now remember, it is physically and they're still physically inactive, so they're a control group experimental treatment group there you were physically inactive and now we measure their body fat again Here's the body fat for the inactive Ninos to begin with. Here's their body fat six months later. No change. The red is the body fat of the Ninos who we put into our activity program. There it starts. There it ends after six months of them doing physical activity. And if we look at our post hoc table, it says this percent body fat in the Ninos before they became physically active and this one are significantly different from one another, so they lost body fat. Not only did they lose body fat, group that did no physical activity. So this is a much more powerful, higher science experimental design because we can say we intervened, this occurred, and if we had not intervened, they would have looked like the group up here. So if you're a researcher, you get very excited and you say, oh, now we need to do another study and I want to not look at just making them physically active, but different levels of physical activity. One group no activity, one group low, one group moderate, one group high, measured before and after, a four by two design. Oh, by the way, whenever you see something four by two like that, if you do the math, that tells you how many means you're going to be comparing. Eight. Entonces, 
Here's my ANOVA summary table. It says, oh, you have statistical significance. Here's the eight different means that we measured. Here's the Tukey post hoc analysis. Notice the post hoc analysis summary table is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> and here are the eight different means. The first four before that six months, the next four after the six months. And you can't see it because the numbers are too small, but the high and moderate activity group have significantly lower percent fat. The low and the inactive group, their body fats don't change. You're very excited, so you decide to do another study and now add a four by three, three measurements across four groups over time. So now we have 12 different means of comparing. <laughs> the post hoc analysis, I actually had to shrink it to fit it onto the slide. It's much bigger than all of this. And there you see the plot of the percent fats before at the second measurement, six months, and then the final third measurement, which we'll say is another six months. <laughs> Statistically, you can analyze this. Design-wise, you can structure this. But intuitively, to understand what you find, the last step where you're trying to say, oh, what does this mean? The more means you have to compare, the harder it becomes to clearly interpret what you're doing. So I mentioned another design the other day, and that was a two by two within, within factorial. One group of women, we measure their creatine kinase, we have them do exercise, we measure their creatine kinase. And if you remember, creatine kinase tells us whether they've damaged their muscles a lot. The first time they do this, they have low estrogen. We then make them come back, same women, and do it with high estrogen. The within, first within, there's two levels, low estrogen, high estrogen. The second within refers to the fact that I measure them twice within that condition. 
I measure them twice within that condition. This is also a factorial design. It is also analyzed with a factorial ANOVA, all right? But you would find this would be called a two by two factorial ANOVA repeated measures. The first one we looked at was not repeated measures. The ANOVA summary table looks slightly different, but there's our mean values, there's our post hoc analysis, and again, I use a two key, and one of the reasons I like it, you can use it on any type of ANOVA. I said there's lots of different post hoc analysis to use with ANOVAs. Some are designed for only certain select types of ANOVAs. The two key is universal and can be used with any, so it makes it a little easier for us. And if we looked at the post hoc results, what we would find is the exercise caused creatine kinase to go up. But the high estrogen condition results in the creatine kinase not increasing as much as the low estrogen and from that we can find that the estrogen is protective. So a few slides about association measurements, both parametric and non-parametric. And then we can take a short break in case anyone needs the baños. So let's go back to our children who are physically inactive. And remember I said with one of these designs, I made them physically active and then I measured their percent body fat again. So I have this body fat and this body fat. And I can calculate a difference for each of the subjects to find out if the body fat for each subject went down 1%, 2%, went up 1%. I can also, since they were sedentary, I could put accelerometers on them and find out now that they're physically active on a daily basis, how many calories do they expend in energy? Mm -hmm. 
And my whole thought has been, if I make them more physically active, they will not add as much fat to their body. They might actually lose fat. And we know that that's going to decrease the risk for them becoming obese. So what I have here is some data that I, I made up. Body fat one, body fat two, the difference between those. And in this column, I have how much activity they were doing on a typical day after they had done six months of the program we introduced. So I think making them physically active is going to keep their body from getting higher. It might actually cause it to decrease. So if I think that's true, then the relationship should be increased Nino's physical activity, or with increased physical activity, should have the greatest change decrease in their percent body fat. So what I do is I create a scale. This is energy expenditure. Here is the percent body fat change, so whether they lost or gained. And each one of those points represents one of the children. So to test that relationship, I can do a measurement of association called the Pearson product moment correlation. And the correlation here is negative 0.83. Meaning, as they are expending more energy, those children doing that have the greatest drop in their percentage of body fat. If I had done just my T-test or my ANOVA and said they were different, That would have been evidence for me to write and say, I think physical activity is good. But that is a significant correlation number. And combining that statistical analysis with my earlier analysis makes my argument that physical activity is helping them lose weight much, much stronger. And this is an important point. When you're designing your research, you're allowed to do more than one statistical analysis to support the argument, answer your research question.
And when, when you calculate the correlation, you get a probability level, just like with the t-test or the ANOVA, to tell you that it's significant. And our criteria, again, is 0 0.05 or less for significance. No. No. You don't need to. You can if you... Um, Any time you can have more than one statistical test give you significance, you're always arguing at a higher scientific level that you are showing more of the truth. Hmm. Yes. Any time that you can do more than one statistical test, an ANOVA for differences, an association test, and have them both significant, you're going to be able to argue at a higher level of science that you are showing the truth of what's occurring. When you do correlation association analysis such as this, one of the things you can think of is looking at your data in this fashion. I have my dependent variable, percent fat change. My independent variable, activity, energy expenditure. This says that they are related and that is a statistically significant relationship. And one of the ways that you will see people report this in the literature is they will take the R value and square it. And there's the R squared, but now it's written as a percentage rather than as a decimal. How influential is physical activity on causing percent body fat? It's almost 70% of the reason why they lost body fat. And this would say that the independent and the dependent variable are extremely strongly related to one another. Manipulating the independent is going to have a change in the dependent.
The Pearson product moment correlation, also just called the Pearson, is a parametric analysis. The non-parametric version of this is called the Spearman correlation. And again, computers will stupid, are stupid. They'll do what you tell them. If you have this kind of non-parametric data and you run a Pearson correlation, it will give you a number. And these are some data that just reflect scores such as this, one, two, three, four, five, although this can actually have a negative scaling. The Pearson correlation on this is 0.67, but when you do the right correlation, non-parametric Spearman, it goes to 0.84. And just like with the Pearson, you can square it to come up with the representative relationship, you can do the same with the Spearman. We're almost at break time. And we still have candy. So intraclass correlation is a parametric correlation. And we see it in research a lot that relates to what we do in physical education, health, and exercise. So let's say Carlos is going to do a research study measuring skin folds on children all through Uruguay. And he is an expert at doing that. But there is only one of him and there is lots of Uruguay. So he decides, I need some helpers with my research. He teaches one student how to do folds. He teaches a second student. He teaches a third student. He says, go practice. When you are ready, you tell me that you are good and we will do a test to determine that. So Carlos finds 11 students and measures one important skin fold site in all 11 students. Then he says, student number one, go measure that same skin fold in those 11 different students. Student two. Student two, do that. Student three, do that. Okay. 
He puts all the numbers into his statistical software and says, please run an intra-class correlation between me and this student, me and this student, me and this student. All correlations are going to be no higher than one or no lower than negative one, but anywhere in between. Carlos versus student one, the correlation is 0.18. One is perfect. Negative one can be perfect, depending. Zero is terrible. You're point one eight. You're close to terrible. Point five eight six. You're not terrible but you're not very good. <laughs> you're almost perfect. Yes. So Carlos says, you can work in my research study, you two go practice, and we'll try again. <laughs> This becomes an important statistical tool when you are doing things such as I just examined because Carlos wants to know that no matter who he works with, they do things as carefully as he does so that when the numbers come in, he has confidence that they are right. <laughs> Logistic regression is, is non-parametric, but it's actually not only non-parametric, it can be sometimes used as a parametric. In this type of regression, you measure something such as body fat, so that's a parametric. But you can also measure something that's non-parametric, such as they smoke cigarettes or they don't smoke cigarettes. That's yes or no, one or two. And what you're predicting almost always is some kind of health outcome. Someone dies of cardiovascular disease or they don't die of cardiovascular disease. And this kind of regression would look at large data to say, oh, people with high levels of body fat and smoke are much more likely to have a death from cardiovascular disease than people who have low percent fat and don't smoke. You see this in pedagogy, education, trying to predict whether children will be successful and pass from one grade to the next. 
And one of the things that's interesting to us is it might be looking at exam scores, but we also know that looking at whether they're physically active or not can make them successful in school. Right. Last slide, and then we'll take a break. A purely non-parametric correlation that can be generated is called the odds ratio. Okay. And I apologize, I said correlation, I mean association. Yeah. When we look at correlations, regardless of parametric or non-parametric, they have to range between one perfect minus one, perfect but in the opposite direction, and either being close to zero is bad. So being close to one, positive or negative, is a very good thing with correlations. Odds ratios can be greater than one, And odds ratios look at the likelihood of something occurring. This is an example a British friend of mine gave me. They have a holiday called Queen's Day. And the Queen's Day is happen, happens to be one where lots of beer is drank. So what you can do is calculate who is more likely to drink beer on Queen's Day, students or professors? So you would ask the students how many of them were drinking beer. You would ask the professors. And they're going to say, yes, I do, or no, I don't. And you calculate total numbers of people that said yes or no. And you set up, and you set up what are called contingency tables. And then you calculate for each answer, yes or no, for each group, student or teacher, what is the actual odds? And the math looks difficult there. It's actually not. It's very logical. And when you go through the final mathematics, what you find are the students, pardon me, the students are 36 times more likely to drink beer than the professors. Ninety students said yes, only twenty professors said yes, 
And when you calculate, it comes out. Why, yes, the students drink more beer. How likely are they? 36 times more. If the odds ratio was calculated as one, it would mean both the students and the professors have the same likelihood of drinking beer. If it's greater than one, one group's more likely. <laughs> and in this case, the students are 36 times more likely. This is something that you can use with non-parametric data. And there are variations of this that you will find, uh, but they all work on the same basis of likelihood of someone having a characteristic or having a behavior, and if that behavior is greater than a comparative group. Let's take a break for baños for everyone, okay. and then we'll do our final little bit. Any more? Yeah. Huh? No. Oh, thank you. No, okay. I can't take these home. I don't need candy. Any more? Yeah. You you just got off work, so you need you need energy. Thank you for coming back. <laughs> so the last topic I want to talk about is scientific writing. The scientific method is, simply put, trying to discover the truth. Scientific writing is nothing more than, than sharing that truth. But writing is difficult. <laughs> and that is whether you are writing in Spanish, you are writing in English. The goal of good writing is clear communication. <coughs> Regrettably, English, which is the premier scientific language right now, has lots of ambiguities making it very difficult to communicate clearly. And often, one of the problems is, as we write, we assume the reader will know exactly what we mean. We need to be kind to our readers and make no assumptions. 
eh, y, no, eh, y no hacer demasiadas de, a, a su eh, presupuesto de poder que entienda en esta We need to explain what we're thinking and wanting to convey as clearly as possible to them. Now, I'm going to talk about how you structure a scientific research paper and what are the different components within it. But I want to take a moment and not use some slides, but look at something I've written on the board. After you have this finished written product, which at this point in writing it, we usually call it a manuscript, it goes to a scientific journal. And you as the research researcher get to decide what journal that's going to be. Whether it's a journal that's published here in Uruguay, in Germany, in the United States, totally up to you. But whether it's here or another country, most scientific journals do the same process. <laughs> you send it to them and they review it. Usually, a journal will have two other scientists, sometimes three, read your manuscript and make comments about it relative to the science level you did and how well you wrote it. And those scientists will make a recommendation to the journal. This should be published. It's a good study. This should be rejected and not published because it's not a good study. Or they might say, we can't decide to have you accept it or reject it we want them to make some changes, explain some more things, to revise it and resubmit. This entire process can take weeks, months, and sometimes even over a year. And it's very common for a rejected manuscript to then be perhaps submitted to another different journal and the process start over again. Mm -hmm. It's also very common to have your manuscript come back. The review process says makes changes. You make those changes. Then it comes back and says, make more changes. And that goes back and forth many times. Up to this point in time, everything you've done with your research has been under your control. This process with the journals is now out of your control. And it's very frustrating because you want to share your information. Yeah. 
It's always very nice when you submit your manuscript and they look at it and say, this is fantastic, it is wonderful, we want to publish this right now, no changes. I have been doing this for 30 some years. I have published almost 300 research papers. I have only had two that have been, this is wonderful, we want to publish it exactly as it is. All the others I had to work and work and work to rewrite it, get the science to the level the journal said, yes, now we will publish it. You are better researchers and scientists than I am, so you will not have that problem. But regardless, it's still going to be difficult. <laughs> now again, remember, at this stage, we call it a manuscript because it's something you're developing. Scientific manuscripts have an introduction, methods, results, discussion, reference section. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you study biology, if you study physical education, if you study social science, they're all structured the same. The introduction is very challenging to write. Many times when I write a manuscript, I'll write the methods, I'll write the results. Those are easy. <laughs> the reason the introduction is sometimes put off and it's hard to write is you have to convey a lot of information in a very short amount of writing. It's usually no more than three to six paragraphs. And a paragraph is usually no more than three to six sentences. That means it's about one published page in length, or if you're doing word processing, about two and a half to three double space pages. In that section, you have to introduce the topic. Body composition in niños. Why is it a topic we care about? You have to establish that it relates to their health and having inappropriate body composition percent fat is something that is going to impact the quality of their life. And you can't just say those things without having references of previous published work that something is truthful and accurate. No 
You have to tell them what you're doing in your study, at least very briefly, and why it's different than every other study that's already been done. You have to establish that something you have thought to do is different and new. And then finally you get to the point where you get to put that purpose, that research question in a declarative statement and perhaps maybe even a hypothesis. As it says on the bottom of the slide, you are selling your research study. I tell my students who are doing work with me, by the time someone reads your introduction, they should be excited and say, why, of course this study needed to be done. We need to know this. And if your reader doesn't have that excitement, go back and write it again. <laughs> The next section, methods, this is easy because basically you are, sometimes it's called methods and procedures, you're just describing what you did. When you design your study, ultimately you're going to write down all of the different things that are going to happen to your subjects, what you're going to do with your helpers and your researchers. So you really have already done this, you just need to put it together. An important thing to think about when you write your methods, are you providing enough information that if someone were reading this, they could go do your study, they could duplicate it? And that's the critical thing when you think about, should I tell them about this or should I not tell them about this? Think about your study and if someone were going to try to do your exact one, do they need to know that information? If they do, then it has to be in. And recognize the last part of the methods. It says analytical procedures. Well, that means your statistics. What did you use as your statistical test? Repeated measures ANOVA, two key post hoc, Cohen D effect size. Explain what you did. Your results section, this should be very straightforward where you describe your subjects if you're looking at groups. If you did statistical tests, report where you have statistical significance and where you don't. Sí, 
and make certain that the entire section is no more than two to five pages and should be double spaced. Very straightforward, no interpretation, just what you found, not what you think it means. The use of tables for information, the use of figures as illustrations is critical in your results. The old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, is very true. But the rule, again, I tell my students, you do not make everything you collected and analyzed a figure. You want to make those measurements that you have that are meaningful, that you want people to remember as figures and illustrations. If it's statistically significant, put it in a figure. If it's not, put it in a table. People remember your figures, your illustrations, they don't remember your tables. Another reason to do that is journals will send your manuscript back and say you have too many figures. So they won't even send it to review to be looked at by other scientists until you get the figures reduced. So do use figures, but make certain it's only on the important significant data. And if you put something into a table, don't put it into the written text part of the results. If you had a table that said, my subjects were 22 years old, 172 centimeters, and 72 kilograms on average, if it's in the table, don't put it in the written part of the results section. That's duplication. That's another thing journals don't like. The next section is discussion. And this is probably the second hardest section to write. I always like to start my discussion sections by reminding people what it was I was doing in the study. What was that research question? What was that purpose? What was my hypothesis? 
You would be surprised how many people have sat down to read a paper, they read the introduction, they go through all the methods, and they go through all the results, and then they say, what were they doing in this study? <laughs> And then it becomes a process of discussing what you found compared to what you thought you would find, a hypothesis, compared to what other studies have found. And again, when I work with my students, one of the common mistakes is they talk about too much. You need to focus and talk about those things that are your significant, important findings that relate to the purpose. And again, an example I might give. We, we mentioned oxygen uptake the other evening. If we're doing a research study to measure oxygen uptake in athletes, when they come to the laboratory, they'll sit down, we'll take their resting heart rate, we'll take their blood pressure. Yeah. We'll write that all down and it goes into our data records. We don't care about that in the research paper. That was just to make certain that they were rested and they were not having some kind of high blood pressure response. That was all for safety. That doesn't go into the report. When you talk about your important findings, it is critical that you compare what you found with any related studies. Internal validity. And you may find there aren't research studies exactly like yours, but you can always find some that are somewhat similar. And we want to know what you found was correct by comparing it to what other work has happened. And then it becomes very important to tell your reader, why do we care? What's the clinical or the practical significance that tells you that this is something that should be published and the world needs to know about it? And every research study, no matter how experienced you are, has problems, limitations. Don't hide your problems. Don't hide the limitations of your work. Explain it to your reader. We measured percent body fat in children throughout Uruguay. Ejemplo, 
we did skin fold analysis which we know is not the most accurate way of body composition we recognize this as a limitation to our study but the most accurate me method dual x-ray absorptiometry was not practical to be done in this study because of the financial cost. There's nothing wrong with staying that. You're being honest and reviewers as well as readers always like to see that honesty from the writer. And then the discussion always ends with a conclusion. And I think the thing I always find that's rather amazing is sometimes people will write the conclusion and it's a fine conclusion, but it doesn't relate to the purpose of the study. If we were talking about our niños again, in conclusion, we were able to measure body composition in niños, 200 niños throughout Uruguay. This is a highly feasible process and procedure. But the question was, them being physically active, would that change their body composition and their percent fat? So I would always remind people, read your purpose, think of the question, and then answer the question in the conclusion. References are the section where you list all of the other research papers or the books or the chapters in books that you have used to help design your study, to come up with the question. And this is important because if someone's going to duplicate your study, they want to know the rationale and basis on why you did something, which you would use a reference to support. Good references are helping other researchers. After you get to that point, you're thinking of submitting to a journal. When I was a student, this young man's age, we probably had 10 journals in the world dealing with our area of exercise physiology that I am. <coughs> I think now there's probably over a thousand. <laughs> so there's lots of journals out there. You can choose any one you want. But if you're trying to make a difference with the work you're doing, 
Choose a journal that is going to be seen by the people you think need to see it. You can find many things on the internet, but there are many things lost on the internet too. <laughs> Many times when you're doing your reference list, you will see certain journals over and over and over again because of the work you've been doing. That sometimes will cue you in to where you might want to submit your paper. Manuscript. Journals get hundreds, if not thousands, of manuscripts a year. And every journal has directions, authors' instructions. And they will tell you exactly how they want everything in your manuscript to be structured and typed and organized. Can you follow directions? Because if you can't, they'll send your manuscript back to you. <laughs> Remember, this is important to you because you care about it. It's going to help others. It's going to help your career. But to the journal, you're just another researcher submitting something. It doesn't mean as much to them, so they're very particular. You have to follow the directions. They'll tell you how to structure your references, how to do your tables, you f your figures. They will send you paperwork for copyright transfer. And you have to follow all their directions, or again, they will just send the manuscript back to you. Obviously, when you write a manuscript, one of the things you decide is who is going to be on as an author. Is it Antonio and Carlos, or just Carlos, or just Antonio? An authorship is something where suddenly your name is very public, it is well recognized, it helps your career. So it's important to make certain you give authorship when it is earned, but also make certain that you don't offer it when it shouldn't be. Many journals now, as part of their paperwork, will make each of the authors sign a form saying, I actually participated as a, a worker in this study, I helped design it, I helped write the manuscript. They want proof that you did something for your name to be there. It's considered unethical science to put someone on a manuscript that has not been significantly involved.
we're almost done for the night because you're very tired and he has class to teach at eight. <laughs> We've talked about design, statistics, then taking that information and interpreting it and sharing it. When I meet with people to talk about research ideas and we start doing that very first part of how do we design this research? We talk authorship then. This is the last part of the research process, writing the manuscript, but you decide a priori early on who's going to be involved. There's no written requirement saying that. That's my personal recommendation. And I learned that the hard way as a young investigator many years ago, that some people aren't very ethical and you should be an author and they don't put you on. And I've seen other researchers who have very gladly put some people on to make them happy because they're their boss. <laughs> it's not my job to pass judgment on them, but I think morally and ethically, if someone is going to be on a research paper, then they have done something in that study where they were valuable. And so I will talk to people ahead of time. You're all going to work in this research with me? Wonderful. I would like for you to be an author on the publication provided you follow through and actually work and help in the study. So a very simple conclusion for the last two nights. Statistics, or for tonight, I'm, I'm sorry. Statistics are challenging to understand and use. And if I get invited back, I can tell you much more. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah. So. Writing is hard work. With each statistics and writing, practice, practice makes it easier. But, but they're always going to be hard work. So with that, I will say muchas gracias, thank you. <laughs>